no fury, like a woman scorned. What the hell happened to your face? A woman's thirst for revenge can be much more powerful than a man's. Untamed rage leads to violent retribution. It was just a frenzy of killing. <laughs> a cold-hearted mother takes terrible vengeance. Jessica sits and watches this murder. A murder she planned. And a jealous wife lashes out. She lost it. She was uh, a wild animal. These deadly women felt they'd been wronged. Bent on revenge, they would take an eye for an eye. Few of us will know exactly when we'll die. This woman does. It's at 6.45 p.m., February 3rd, 1998. She's taken a life. And now the state of Texas will take its revenge by lethal injection. She had joy and peace in the midst of it. Being with her, it was the most incredible experience of my life. She lived her life and made it count for other people. She was just a mean, vengeful, evil person. Her life story shocks a nation. Her execution divides it. Just who is Carla Faye Tucker? She's a party girl. Booze, drugs, sex. Just 23. Carla is out of control. There aren't many reports of people saying that they were shocked at the behavior she later was accused of. Carla had lots of problems, and everybody knew them. She's been abusing drugs since elementary school. Bouncing between frenetic highs and crashing lows, she develops a frightening temper. She was a very violent person who would fight with you in a minute, a man or a woman. She had many barroom fights. She was a tough little gal. Homicide detective J.C. Mosier remembers a violent young woman with no future. Carla never had a chance to go anywhere but prison. She was destined for prison. I've got something to show you to make you feel real bad. Black chocolate? She is set on that path by the one person who should have protected her, Mom. Her mother was a drug addict, prostitute, who also had a normal, square day job, working as a secretary. You gotta lick it. Lick it? Lick it real good. For young Carla, there are no boundaries, no rules. That, my dear girl, is your first job. Her teachers had given up on her. Her mom was living her own life, a party life. <coughs> Encouraging Carla to go with her into that lifestyle. Author Linda Strom would become Carla's close friend. Carla herself started smoking marijuana when she was eight. So by the time she was 12, she was shooting heroin. <laughs> To pay for her addiction, Carla starts working at 14. Again, she follows her mother's lead. 
her mom was her idol, and so her mother began to school her in the art of prostitution. I'm not really sure anyone can say Carla had a childhood, even a bad one. There's no way a child who's exposed to drug use by their own mother when they're eight, nine years old, when they're exposed to sexual behavior of adults by their own mother. That girl doesn't stand a chance in life, not a chance at all. Carla's mind is a pressure cooker of drugs and abuse, just waiting to blow. What the hell happened to your face? When a friend, Sean, is beaten by her boyfriend, Carla takes it personally. Sean had been telling Carla about Jerry beating on her and treating her bad. Carla knows all about the alleged abuser, Jerry Dean. They were housemates, but that didn't work out. Carla and Jerry had had a bad relationship. Allegedly, he had cut up some pictures of Carla and her mom, which really upset Carla, to the point that she had actually hit him, uh, broke his glasses, and cut his eye. Once again, Jerry Dean is in Carla's sights. Little surprise to former FBI agent Candace DeLong. Carla had a lot of trouble with men, and this man represented every man she'd ever hated. Carla wants revenge. It's time to mess this guy up. She enlists her boyfriend, yeah. Danny Garrett. Carla wanted to go over and kick his ass, is what she wanted to do. The plan is to confront Jerry and steal his motorcycle. But the plan goes terribly wrong. The ax was right there beside the bed, and she grabbed the ax, and it started. What? After a wild three-day party of booze and drugs, most of Carla Faye stuff. Tucker's friends have passed out. You gotta out. do something about it, Danny. You gotta do something about it. He's gotta be taught a lesson. But not Carla and her boyfriend, Danny. Get it for your baby. They're high and plotting revenge. Gonna do it? Let's get it, baby. Let's get it. She had so many drugs in her system, almost a dozen, which included things like methamphetamine, dilaudid. She had uppers and downers. This is an enormous number of drugs. Forensic pathologist Dr. Janice Amatuzio says Carla is in an altered state. This cocktail would certainly have put her out of her mind. Their victim, Jerry Dean, has no idea of the approaching storm. He's clashed with Carla before, but this time will be the last. I think Jerry, as soon as he realized it was Carla, knew he was in a lot of trouble. What are you doing in here? I told you I was gonna mess you up. No, no, get out of here. Danny stuns Jerry with a hammer. Oh, 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 oh. Get him, Danny, get him. Get him good. Oh, oh. They'd come to steal a motorcycle. Now, Carla decides on murder with a brutal weapon. Carla started swinging the axe on Jerry. Do you like that, Jerry? I just think it's an accumulation of booze and drugs and her intense hate for Jerry. A pickaxe is a heavy instrument. It is used to penetrate deeply, to deliver a large amount of force over a very small area. It's gonna cause tremendous crushing injuries, fracturing of bones, tearing and ripping of blood vessels and nerves. Jerry was struck around 35 times, as I remember. 
endless frenzy might have ended there. But something moves. Danny! She was hiding under the covers. Uh, they didn't know she was there. I'm sure she was just hoping they would finish and, uh, and go away. Deborah Thornton is having a one-night stand on the wrong night. She was just an unlucky person being at the wrong place at the wrong time. The surprise witness yeah. must be silenced. <laughs> Deborah first was screaming for her life, and then she was in so much pain, she was screaming for them to take her life. Deborah Thornton told them, please, just kill me and get it over with. And Danny continued to hit her until uh, she was dead. And they left the ax embedded in her chest. A horrible, terrible scene of violence. It left a lot of us who had been homicide detectives for quite a while, we were, we were amazed at the brutality of uh, this kind of crime. shocking case proves easy to solve. Because Carla is proud of what she's done. She wanted to cement her reputation among her friends as a badass, as the toughest girl in Houston. Houston's tough biker crowd give her up to police. You're like a fish in the ocean. If you open your mouth, you get the hook. Carla shows no remorse. She says in this eerie, squeaky voice, hell yes. That was her answer to whether she enjoyed the killings, and that was my answer to whether or not the jury should give her the death penalty. Convicted of first-degree murder, Carla and Danny are imprisoned on death row. And it's here that Carla's brutal life takes an astonishing turn. As she read the Bible, something hit her, and she realized for the first time what she had done. It's a genuine, radical story of somebody who is like in darkness and walks into light. I think this was a real conversion. I think she really became a Christian good person. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It's a metamorphosis from what she was to what she became. It was extremely amazing and, in my mind, really true. It happened. She did it. It wasn't phony. Uh, I don't think there was a phony bone in her body when she died. I want to walk arm in arm with you, Jesus. Save my sins. Forgive me my sins, Jesus. The tough, streetwise hooker becomes, in the eyes of some, an angel. Everybody loved her. I could introduce you to officers who, when they talk about Carla, will say, my life was never the same after I met her, after I had that encounter. I have to say that, too. The governor is not convinced. After 14 years on death row, the state of Texas will have retribution. When she was getting ready to go to her execution, she said, I'm praying that my death will give those who can't forgive me the freedom to forgive so that they're free of this and don't have to spend their whole life dealing with what I've done. car is found deep in the forests of Georgia. Police smell something strange. I smell some burning meat. I smell some flesh burning. And there's probably some poachers, you know, that shot a couple of deer and they're in the trunk. 
The sheriff pops open the trunk, looks down and says, those aren't deer. Those are human beings. Both of their bodies were riddled with bullets, many, many more than was necessary to kill them. They are victims of the deadly revenge of a ruthless woman, Jessica McCord. She's at the top of the list of the worst people I've ever prosecuted. The first time Alan Bates kisses Jessica McCord, his life is set on a dangerous course. The easygoing boy from a good family has become her prey. Jessica sets her sights on this guy, and that's it. That's my golden ticket for life. There's my white picket fence, my long days on the couch watching soap operas while I'm having his babies. Jessica is soon pregnant. Alan decides to marry her. Hey, man. How His you doing? family can't believe it. <laughs> we never imagined that he would end up with someone like that. Never. To Alan's brothers, Kevin and Robert Bates, this looks anything but a perfect match. It definitely feels like she was controlling um, from the beginning. If you wanted me, you would have taken that phone call. She definitely seemed to have, or seemed to assert a certain control over Alan and his thoughts and, and what he would want to do and how he would spend his time. As the years pass, Jessica's behavior gets worse. Okay, y'all, I'm packing up now. Start your homework. We're fine. Jessica was really the instigator of the arguments and the fights. Alan continually wanted to work on things. Alan was a Christian. He was dedicated to this marriage. He was dedicated to raising a good family, no matter what she did to him, it seemed. But Jessica just couldn't be happy enough. These aren't just mood swings. She suffers from borderline personality disorder and narcissism. Quick to anger self-obsessed, dangerous. Jessica is the wife from hell. A combination of somebody with borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder would be someone that would be almost impossible to be around on a daily basis. It would be the classic, it's all about me when it comes to that person. years of heartache and turmoil. Alan can see only one way out. Divorce. What the hell? You're not leaving. Alan really is at his wit's end. He can't take it anymore. Yeah, you just watch me. You just watch me in. She's starting to get violent. She comes at him with a butcher knife one day. <laughs> And she goes to stab him, and he slams a door, and she, boing, she stabs the door instead. Divorce is no escape. Instead, it triggers something far worse. People with Jessica's personality disorders are not the kind of people that are going to be able to sit down with a spouse and work out the issues of a divorce or separation and child custody issues. Not at all. Nothing will make her happy. When she gets what she wants, she'll want more. Vengeful Jessica declares war on Alan. The children are her weapons. Jessica really begins to torment this guy with his children, using these children, really, as pawns in this game of chess. Author M. William Phelps says Jessica is a master of mind games. Visits would be planned with his children, and they wouldn't be there. He'd try to call him on a telephone. Jessica would say, you can't talk to him. It's not coming. 
Meanwhile, she turns around and tells the kids, see, he never calls you. He doesn't want to visit you. Ain't your daddy here yet? She's a narcissist, and she enjoyed that. Their life was her stage. And the players in this drama were Alan and those kids. And she had control over it all. That's one thing that Jessica loved to have, and that's control. You said I'll be able to see the kids. When a court gives Alan access, she ignores it. Well, I don't know, maybe next week? Come on, you know. Nothing that the court said was ever going to uh, influence Jessica's decision to even let him see the, see the girls. I want to see the kids. She went as far as to try to change their names and put them um, in a different school. And then when we found out where they were, then, um, then she pulled them out and homeschooled them. And it was all in a kind of a desperate attempt to hide them from him. The court will not be defied. And Jessica is briefly jailed for contempt. She makes a terrible promise. Someone has to pay. Whatever Jessica wanted, Jessica was going to get. And if it required murder, that was fine. Bates is a man in trouble. Don't call him when he divorces his wife, Jessica, no. he makes a vicious enemy. It's over a six-year period of time where in and out of court, they're, they're, he's fighting her for custody. He's fighting her just to see the kids. Alan makes a fresh start with new wife, Tara. I definitely feel that Tara was Alan's soulmate. She brought new life back into Alan when she came into his life. Jessica has found someone, too. Of course we can do this. I'm not going to lose my girls, OK? I'm not going to In Jeff McCord, she once again has a man she can control. Jeff is the kind of guy who would, if he loved a woman, would believe anything she told him. Think about it, think about it. But Jessica isn't getting on with life. She's getting revenge. Alan was going to ultimately get those kids away from her, and she could never allow that. She could not allow him to win. Is this what you want? Huh? She has a wicked plan. No, I mean Jessica goes to her husband, Jeff, and she says, Jeff, you got to help me do something. The only way we're going to get rid of him, because he's such a nuisance in our lives, is if you kill him. And Jeff McCord, a cop, he's a cop. His job every day is to save lives, keep justice, and stop violence. Says, well, we got to come up with a plan. A few days later, as planned, Alan and Tara arrive to pick up the children. Hey. Hey, where are the kids? Oh, they're inside. And walk straight away. into a death trap. Come on, come on. Come on. Alan knew Jessica's violent history. She tried to stab him with a knife one time. I'm surprised, really surprised, he went into her home. I don't think he would have entered that home had it not been the lure that his children were going to put on a show for him. Okay, y'all want to come downstairs here? Jessica invites them into the living room and says, sit down on the couch. The kids are upstairs. Kids weren't even at the house at the time. Another lie. OK, they won't be long. You know, the girls have actually been quite sick. Really? Yeah, so I don't know if it's a good idea to be going out in this weather. Look, uh, we got to get going, so. And Alan is impatient. We got to catch a fly. We got to go. What's all this hospitality all of a sudden? Well, Sam, Sam's actually Look. having trouble with their nap. So Jeff just walks up, pulls the gun out of his back. She falls to the ground. Alan gets up. And he just fires at Alan four times. While Jessica sits and watches this murder unfold in front of her eyes, a murder she planned.
According to Chief Deputy District Attorney Roger Brown, the seeds of her appalling crime were sown years before. She grew up in a broken home. Her mother and father were divorced, and her father was abusive, physically abusive to her and to her mother. He wound up killing a woman in Tennessee. I don't necessarily believe in the bad seed, but maybe she got it. With two bodies in the trunk, the killers make a late night dash across the state line into Georgia. They pull the car into a field. They pour the gasoline around the car. On the car, in the trunk, open the trunk. They pour the gasoline on the bodies. They pour the gasoline on the seats of the car. Jeff goes over and he lights a paper towel and he throws it in the car, nothing happens. What? So then Jessica goes over and takes care of it herself. She lights another paper towel, puts it in there, and it kind of yes! This car was just engulfed in flames. Jessica's arrogance will be her undoing. It is a misconception, as a rule, that you can burn a body by just pouring a little accelerant over it, such as gasoline or diesel fuel, and burning it. Because you see, when we use gasoline or diesel fuel, the temperature gets to eight or 900 degrees. Temperatures of 1,500 degrees for a period of several hours are required to cremate a body, to reduce it to just ash. And most individuals do not tend to fire for that length of time. The bodies survived the blaze, along with a bullet and a scrap of paper towel with a distinctive design. Retired detective Laura Brignac says police find another vital clue. Fortunately, during the fire, the license plate fell off of the car. And so immediately, it was traced back to the Birmingham airport where Tara and Alan had flown into and rented the car. When investigators find out where Alan and Tara were supposed to be, they close in. They go to Jessica's house under a search warrant. They find paper towels that match that paper towel and Inside the garage, it came through the wall. They find another bullet that matches ballistically to that bullet find at the Georgia crime scene. Even under arrest for murder, Jessica McCord is coldly defiant. She was very cool and collected about it and gave off an impression that I will regain control and I will, I'll win in the end. Jessica McCord is one of the most vicious, cold-hearted criminals that I've ever dealt with. I prosecuted hundreds of murder cases, some very mean and bad people. Jessica McCord is at the top of the list because she's truly evil. Jessica and Jeff are found guilty of murder and sentenced to life. For Jessica, there's no chance of parole. She will die in jail. This is a very sad story, because from the moment Alan met Jessica as a teenage boy, it set his life on a path to destruction. She took something from our family that was very dear to us for, for really no good reason. I think that what she did to her kids to take their father away from them in such a manner was the cruelest thing. They were truly the most innocent victims in the whole thing. For some women, the burning desire for vengeance is a dangerous emotion. 
Revenge is the number one motivator of murder. It's a very powerful force. And deadly revenge can be taken anywhere. four-star hotel. Clara Harris, by all accounts, is a really wonderful human being. <laughs> For this one brief moment in her life, she lost it. <laughs> she was a, a wild animal. David Harris. What? What's this? It's a salad. I made it for you. Yeah, but it, I don't like rocket in my salad. David Harris oh, David. was a self-indulgent, egotistical clod. Everything about David was have the best of everything, have the best looking woman, have the best car, have the best house on the block, which they did. Texan author Stephen Long says that while David Harris seems to have it all, he still wants more. He wants his receptionist, Gail Bridges. Gail Bridges is a little cutie. She's a pretty good looking woman herself. So it was a situation where David just wanted it all. For months, David cheats on Clara Harris, barely covering his tracks. The affair became quite obvious to the employees in David's orthodontics office. And one of them eventually went to Clara and told her. David's affair will become his death sentence. found out her husband was having an affair, her world ended. I am your wife! I am your wife! To lose her husband was to lose everything that was important to her. Do you love her? Do you love her? Her standing in the community, how others saw her, everything. And she could not deal with that. A shattered Clara won't leave her husband. She responds with obsession about her rival for David's love. She begged him to know about the other woman, demanded that he tell her about the other woman. According to private investigator Bobby Baca, that request sparks a searing comeback. And he said, OK, here's the differences. She has a boob job. You don't. She has little feet. You have big feet. She got no fat. No fat, she's perfect. She fits better in bed with me than you do. She's smaller, she's more petite. You're fat, she's not. She basically made him tear her ego down. For David to tell Clara he was having an affair with another woman was like stabbing her in the heart. But to give her details and compare her to the other woman was like turning the knife. Clara couldn't take it. With jealous determination, Clara sheds the pounds. But the affair goes on. Clara was desperate to save her marriage. And she thought, because of things David said, that if she lost weight, 
if she was prettier, if they made love more often, that would be all it would take. But those are very shallow fixes for a very damaged marriage. Soon, the damage to her marriage will be complete when Clara takes matters into her own hands. He tells Clara he's going to break up with Gail, and he takes Gail to bed. He couldn't possibly have been thinking about what Clara would do. On an upscale Houston street, in a lavish house, A marriage is on the rocks. Clara Harris is becoming desperate. There's no evidence that Clara has any kind of psychiatric disorder. She had cheating husband disorder. For her, big problem. Dentist David Harris has been caught having an affair with his receptionist, Gail Bridges. <laughs> His next lie will turn this once loving wife into a killer. David told Clara that he was going to meet with Gail and break off the relationship once and for all. But Clara doesn't trust her husband anymore. She goes to private investigator Bobby Baca. She said, here's all the case information. He's going to meet her tonight. Um, if you can get close and get recordings of what they're saying, she wanted that. Bobby puts one of her team on the case. She soon discovers that David Harris has no plans to break up with his lover, Gail. He went up into a hotel, checked into the hotel. He was with the other woman. Wait a minute, sexy boy. And at that point, we just wait for them to come out and video them coming out. And there's no reason why a married man would be alone in a hotel with another woman unless there is adultery. Oh, I can't believe it. And he lied to me, and he's down here. You're right, Mom. It's all sick of Mom. When Clara learns the truth from the PI firm, oh, I'm so curious. she snaps. Enraged, she makes 16-year-old stepdaughter, Lindsay, phone her father. David Harris. Daddy, you have to come home Bradley soon. With a lie to lure okay, the mother, lovers you out. Daddy, All right. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. And that is where our story really becomes incredibly violent because she saw them come downstairs, get out of an elevator, hand in hand. And Clara Harris lost it. Clara attacks Gail and wrestled her to the ground in the lobby of this hotel. She snapped flying into a rage, not caring who she hurt or how bad. It's more than just a struggle. Clara's vengeful fury is shocking. The fact that Clara attacked Gail, and then once she was pulled off, went back and bit her, she's acting like an animal. Then, the final humiliation. David Harris told her, it's over, Clara. You've blown it, it's over. And he walked out with the other woman. But it isn't over. This fight is about to enter its final bloody round. I don't think there was much going on in Clara's mind at the time of the attack. Just needing to destroy the two people who had destroyed her. 
If she had a gun, she would have shot them right there. If she'd had a knife, she would have stabbed them. She had her hands, she had her teeth, and then she had her car. Clara guns the car. In her blind anger, she's racing through the parking lot. She came around. That's when my PI first saw her. David is escorting Gail around the hotel to the back. David pushed Gail. He did not get out of the way. Clara hit him. According to my investigator, when Clara's car struck David, his face hit the dash, and his teeth were flying everywhere. There's more horror to come. As Clara turns the car. And then began this circuitous route of her coming back around to run over him again and again and again. Every time that car went over David Harris, it was like a meat grinder. to witness her own father's death. Clara stopped the car and got out and grabbed David, who was at that time barely breathing. And she picked him up and said, David, look at what you made me do. Clara Harris is found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to 20 years in prison. I think Clara killed David because David killed their marriage. After years of belittlement and an ongoing affair, Clara could not be pushed any further. The only way to end that kind of pain was to kill the source of the pain. It's lucky that Gail wasn't also killed. The problem is that Clara Harris loved David too much. She loved him to the point that she was willing to kill to keep anyone from having him. Unfortunately, it was David who she was willing to kill. When these deadly women got angry, they hit back. Faye Tucker couldn't control her explosive vengeance. Jessica McCord took ice-cold revenge on a loving father. And Clara Harris killed in a fit of jealous rage. Feeling betrayed and wronged, payback was brutal and bloody as they took an eye for an eye.